Hey, my friend, let me ask you a question. What is a money lever? What is a marketing lever? If you want to make money, I'm going to rank the best and the worst things, especially if you have a local business. It might make some of you irritated and angry. I'm just going to share my opinion and hopefully it helps you. Let's look at this list here. We have email marketing, direct mail, flyers. There's all these things. You can see it probably on the screen here. Uh, what is the best thing? Well, the answer, the real answer is it totally depends. But in general, if you have an existing business, we always want to close our gap starting with the low hanging fruit. So let me back up a second. What does close the gap mean? Well, you make a certain amount of money right now, right? And you want to make a certain amount of money and the delta, the difference between those, that's the gap. If you're at a half a million, you want to hit a million, you have a $500,000 gap. And then the question becomes, well, what do I do exactly? What do I do first? What do I do second? You know, a lot of people are stuck simply because they work on the wrong things in the wrong order. You know, it's my opinion that a small business owner's core job is to be obsessed first and foremost with closing the gap. Every week on Monday, you should ask yourself, what's my gap and what am I going to do about it? You know, because if you break down a whole year's revenue into bite-sized chunks, it's very manageable. It's not that hard. It just feels big. You know, this half a million dollar gap or whatever it is for you, but you might need to go get $3,000 that week in new business on top of what you're already going to make to be on pace to close the gap, right? And so if you were going to start, what is low-hanging fruit? Low-hanging fruit is the stuff that doesn't cost money. It just takes creativity and a little bit of planning, and it makes money. And that's the best stuff, right? Paid marketing is amazing. We're going to talk about that. But if you have an existing customer list for most local businesses, your email list is probably going to be one of the places that we'd start because these people already know you. They already like you. They already trust you. You have a relationship. They already gave you money. But most people don't engage their past customers enough. Or if you're like, nope, nope, I do. I do engage them, Josh. There's still some mistakes being made. And it's in the way that you engage them. I'll give you a couple examples. So when you send out an email, if you're like most small business owners across America, it's very transactional. It almost feels dirty because your customers only hear from you when you want something for them. And that's not great, right? What if the only time you told your wife that you loved her was when you wanted to have some special mommy daddy time, if you know what I'm saying? Can it, you know what I'm saying? I like mommy daddy special time. But you have to not do that, right? Same with your customers. If you send out an email that says 10% off spring special, book now. Some people will book, but you're leaving a huge amount of money on the table. It's actually not rare. When I work with a small company, for them to make 10, 20, 30,000 real quick, just from changing the way they do their emails. I'll give you a couple of rules of thumb. Number one, you never just send one email. If you're going to do an email promotion to make money, we always send a campaign, never a one-off. Say it with me, class. Never send one. We always send a campaign. So let's look at it as three emails. The second rule is that you want to have a logical justification for your campaign. What is a logical justification? Well, it's pretty simple. It's the reason that you're contacting them other than, please give me money. You ever seen the movie Oliver? Is that what it's called, Will? Oliver Twist? The little boy's like, please, sir, can I have some more porridge, right? <laughs> that is this great classical musical, but that's what business owners do. When you send out your one email offering 10% off, you're saying, please, sir, can we have some more porridge? We don't want to do that. There needs to be a different reason why we're sending this campaign, making this offer, and putting this promotion out there. And it can be almost anything. Did you know that there are weird holidays for every single day of the year? If you go to timeanddate.com, they'll give you a list. You know, there's like National Chips and Salsa Day, and there's, you know, Best Friend Day, and there's all these things. Love a Puppy Day. I don't know. There's a bunch of them. And when you have a, an excuse like that, that could be a logical justification. Another logical justification could be hey, your name came across my desk this morning and it looks like you're due for a service, but we have a problem. We only have 10 more slots left. And so I wanted to give you a courtesy to make sure we get you scheduled. And that reframes your three-part email sequence to be a customer service-y feeling thing. So we start with that. There's some other low-hanging fruit stuff to make money too. So if you're looking at money levers, the next one that stands out to me is networking. Networking is the other most underutilized thing ever. I'm gonna put that in the top row on my chart here as well because you know the best way to get friends is to be friendly. And you know, a one relationship could be the only door you need to open to your next 100, 200, $500,000, believe it or not. Well, who do you network with? Well, you want to make a list. 
Some people call it a dream 100 list of the people that you wish knew you. Have you ever heard the quote that it's not what you know, it's who you know? That can be said better. A better way to say it, and shout out to Edwina Adams' husband for giving me this. He told me one time, he said, Josh, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. That's the question. Who in your town locally knows you? Who is sending you business? Who is a doorway to 20 customers, to 30 customers, to three customers a month? These are relationships you need to build. You got to do work. You know, it reminds me of the other quote, you dig your well before you're thirsty. You wander through town and you become friendly. You add value to people. You keep it organized. You follow up and really good things happen. You could be one relationship away from your next $10,000 job, your next $100,000 referral, but almost no one that has a tiny business uh, is doing these types of things in an organized way. But when you go up to these big multi-million dollar businesses, even as big as Starbucks and Pepsi, they're doing joint venture marketing deals all the time for billions of dollars. And the next one would be referrals. Referrals is another example of low hanging fruit. I'm sure that you ask for referrals and if you're great at what you do, I'm sure that you get referrals, but did you know that you can modify the choreography of like how you ask for referrals and you could triple or quadruple or 10 X the amount of referrals you get. Did you ever think about it? I mean, most people ask for referrals, but how come some people 40% of their revenue comes from referrals and other people 5%. I think the national average is around five to 10% of the revenue is from referrals. How do we get it to 20? Well, the answer depends on the type of business you have, but I'll give you some pointers. The first thing we need to do is ask for it lots of times. We don't ask for it one time, we ask for it lots of times. Maybe when you first book the appointment, that's the first time you ask. And when you show up to do the estimate, that's the second time you ask. And then when they hire you and you're on the job site, that's the third time you ask. And then you do a customer service call to follow up and make sure they're satisfied, that's the fourth time you ask. Maybe you send a note or a postcard in the mail thanking them for their business, that's the fifth time you ask. And then maybe there's an email that goes out, maybe that's the sixth time you ask. Just that by itself will create literal free money for you really quickly. You know, but the other rule with referrals is to look at your choreography. It's not just asking a lot, although that's a good step one. The other thing is, is what happened right before you asked? And I'll give you an example. If you just say, hey, we're a small family business, always looking for referrals. If you just say that, that's good to say that. But a better way to do it is to wait until, until the customer says, wow, you guys just blew my mind. This is amazing. And then immediately ask right at that exact time right? If you got a flyer on your door for a fire alarm system for your house while your shed was on fire, do you think you'd save it and give the company a call? Yes. The reason why is because the timing was perfect. So when you're wrapping up with a customer and you ask them, hey, Mrs. Jones, did we meet and exceed your expectations today? Oh, Billy, you did a fantastic job. I'm just glowing. It's amazing. Your company's amazing. Great. Can you do us a favor? We're a small family company that relies on referrals from good people like you. Just those two things can you know, magnify the amount of referrals you get. The rest of the list here, let's talk about some boots on the ground stuff, right? We have things like yard signs, which can be low cost and effective. We have things like door to door, which makes most people want to throw up, but it literally works. Okay. And these are what I call boots on the ground. You know, you strap on your boots, you go out and you do stuff. But just like with the first examples I gave, it's how do you do it? You know, there's mastery of each of these things that you can learn. And if you don't achieve mastery on any of them, you're going to be kind of bad at most of them. And you get discouraged. You think there's something wrong with you or with your market. And it's not true. Flyers would be another boots in the ground strategy. And then, you know, then we get down to like direct mail. So in the, in the third category, I'll put direct mail and then I'll put paid social media kind of together. And the thing is, is these are good, but we want to make sure that before you're spending money on marketing, that your profitability is correct, your pricing is correct, and that you have a process for ascension. You know, if you're selling a cleaning service, what do we sell them next? If you're selling a $500 thing, how do we get 15% of the people to buy the $1,200 next thing? Because when you have that value ladder figured out, it's way less risky to advertise using money because your customers are worth more dollars to you. Typical small business owners don't really know their numbers because they're overworked and underpaid and it's stressful and they have a kid and they have a dog and then they hopefully have a hobby that they sometimes do and they kind of neglect the numbers of their business. But essentially what needs to happen when you're paying for marketing is we need to make sure that your customers are worth 
more than they are now before you're doing the paid marketing. And what this does, is it gives you freedom. It gives you elasticity. It's not scary to advertise in the same way that it would be for your competitor who's just doing the thing, same things they've always done. And it changes the rules. This is why big, big companies can spend so much advertising. They have a really good hidden secret ascension strategy and follow-up system that makes way more money on the back end show up inside their business. And Larry, the little guy, maybe doesn't have that. And then let's put organic social media content. Maybe uh, I'll put it in row two. Okay. I kind of skipped it because I wasn't sure where to put it. I think obviously it's very valuable and you should do it. The problem is, is for some people you need money right now. And it can be a very slow strategy. You can pop off on TikTok. I don't know. I don't know what kind of dance moves you have and how magnetic you are on camera. So it can work, but it can take a huge amount of time. And so a lot of business owners are basically scared to go do flyers and yard signs and knock on doors. They're nervous to go network. They're nervous to send emails to their past customers. And so they spend way too much time trying to create a great Canva image to post on Facebook so that two people like them, uh, to, so that two people like the image and one of them is your mom. I don't know what to do with that one. Obviously it can be huge, but you gotta be honest with yourself. And then last but not least, we have TV and radio. <laughs> I'll put it at the bottom. But it's not because it can't work. You know, one of my business partners, Michael Kaplan, built a carpet cleaning business, primarily and almost exclusively using radio to scale. And he took this company from about 600,000 in revenue to over 18 million a year in revenue. Can you imagine cleaning carpets, doing three, 400,000 a week, sucking dirt out of carpet, right? And the way he did it was through radio. And it really broke a false belief for me personally. You know, sometimes we tell ourselves stories like, oh, radio, that doesn't work. That's not true. It can work. And I've never personally spent a lot of money on radio. The money that I did spend, I lost it because I didn't have mastery over that channel. But depending on your market, depending on your business, it, of course it can work. But we have to get back to basics. You have to have good economics, know your numbers, know how to make your customers worth more. And then it's actually fun to do marketing because it doesn't feel like you're pulling a slot machine lever in Vegas. And that really is possible. I hope that you got value out of this video. You can win with marketing. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. And if you do figure it out, you're going to rise above all of your competition because most of them are asleep at the wheel. See you in the next video.